they got those damn big boats. And they could, they could catch every damn fish that's allowed to be caught on this coast. Now, it may not be fit to eat when it gets into shore, but they can certainly catch the fish, okay? So they really don't want us in it. I don't okay. think they want me at all. I, want, I think they want me to go work in a non-union tire factory is what they want me to do. Tell you the honest truth. A narrow strip of sea along these Atlantic shores has always been the common property of communities. Now the multinationals make those people and many thousands of square miles of ocean their own. Half a dozen vital cultures may go the way of others we have seen destroyed. The sea boils with strange chemicals while one very worthy way of life dissolves like the family farm. It is not inevitable. It does not have to be. It is not too late. It will not be easy. hundreds to the present day, Nova Scotian fishermen have fought for the right to a trade union of their own choice, an end to poverty and subservience. Until the outbreak of World War II, their average yearly income was never more than $100. Fishermen here were forced to leave for the Boston States or British Columbia. John Richardson, Little Harbor on the South Shore of Nova Scotia. The government here, they, they won't recognize a union, and, and in British Columbia, they've had a union. I was out there in 1939, I went west. They had a union there, and uh, you had to belong to the union to go fishing. And they, they were so far ahead of Nova Scotia in prices and, and the wages, and they still are, because we've got no, nothing. As long as we're divided, why, they can walk right over us. In the late 1930s, the Canadian Seamen's Union and their regional organizer, Charles Murray of Halifax, had signed up fishermen from the South Shore to the tip of Cape Breton. The Union Drive was challenged at Lockport in the early winter of 1939 when the fish companies conspired to lock out and starve the community into submission. The Angus L. Macdonald government betrayed its own Trade Union Act, the promise of which had swept them to power in 1936. In the two-month conflict that ensued, the regime sent 60 RCMP strikebreakers to smash the picketers as they prevented trainloads of frozen fish from leaving town. Errol Williams was a fish plant worker of the 1939 Lockport Union. What about the companies at that time? Were, companies? were they worried about the men? Worried? My friend, they, wouldn't, they couldn't care less. They was worried about that. That dollar, that's what they was worried about. That was the thing that was concerned them most. They didn't care. I remember having fish for Christmas dinner. That's what it was. We would sit down sometimes, right? nine boys and three girls, mother and father, 14 of us, family. Well, the old man years ago had to go to the States, go to another country to try to make a living for the family. Go away from home, pay taxes in this place. You tell about archaic, what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you, there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the story. You young men, you, 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 I mean, I couldn't, I, it's in my mind, but I can't, ex I can't tell you, I can't express it to you. In October of 1978, Charles Murray was invited by history teacher George Perry to speak with Lockport High School students. The students' questions centered on why the Lockport fish companies had locked out the workers so soon after the union was formed. According to my sources, you arrived in Lockport approximately two to three weeks before the lockout began. And they also say that the fishermen and the fish handlers in this town were getting along fine with their own union, minding their own business, and getting along quite well with the management. And according to them, you spurred on this lockout and you caused the lockout, you and Pat Sullivan, by your arrival and you trying to, to work out this thing with the workers. Is there any truth in this? Look, one of the things was Pat Sullivan and his chief interest, because he didn't know a fisherman from nothing. But what, he was the president of the Canadian Seamen's Union, and there was every reason to believe that a whack of a lot of Nova Scotia fishermen were going to be taken up to the lakes as scabs to break the Canadian Seamen's Union. 
And he believes that if the fishermen were organized and got decent conditions down here and so on, and that they were members of the trade union movement along with the sailors on the lakes, that they would not go up and act as scabs. But there was nothing wrong with our union. We had over, we had 100%. There were nobody that didn't belong to the union. My father was president, and your supervisor principal there was one of the officers in the union. Competent men, men of brains, I would say, in that time. Men that you could trust, along with Charlie Murray and Pat Sullivan. And they went for recognition that we would, they have to bargain with the employees. The companies come with a hammer and nails, I was there. Said, your service is no longer required. And take your belongings, they've done away with their fish, they dumped them down the hatches and put them in the fish meal plant that they could handle and take your belongings and get. So they didn't have any employees to bargain with. It was intimidation. They wanted you to work. There was no such a thing as hours on the clock. They called you in 2 o'clock in the morning. There's a man standing in the door there. From the, that would verify that. And 2 o'clock in the morning, you worked off them. There was no overtime. And chi coolie wages, Chinese wages. So these gentlemen here that come here, I got the greatest admiration and respect regardless of their politics or religion, like you say. That's a man's prerogative, that's a man's right, or anybody else's right. So these people come here to try to alleviate the, the, the condition that people were in in Lockport, to try to get a little better working conditions, a little more money. People was in debt to the stores, taxes, and everything else. And it was only a legitimate reason that they should have a chance, a fair shake, not be intimidated or exploited, which was the case. Parker Melanson and Bobby Williams, Jr. were fishermen who were locked out in 1939. <laughs> no, come here, Bobby. Go ahead. Come here, Bobby. Go ahead, you're older than uh, I am. Well, his father, his father was fishing at the time. Oh, yeah. Trying my, to bring up a big family. Was. Well, he had and, nine and, boys uh, and three girls. When the lockout, when they put the lockout on, well, it made it bad for the shore people, too, you know, the people who were working in the plants. They had to quit, too. Well, there was a few that stayed in, scabs. They didn't want to, they was a kind of against us, you see. I'd name them off, but I, I don't like to. Well, was, while the strike was on, we, we wasn't uh, outrageous. We, no, we, we were didn't sensible. do any harm. We, we were sensible, sensible, sure. We were sensible, and yeah. All, all we wanted was living. Norman Anderson, fish plant worker, was a member of the 1939 Lockport Union. We, we uh, stayed up in the, in the Union all over Bally's store. And uh, they redeemed the pickets every two hours. They stayed there all night. You had your turn to go down for two hours. Some went to Swim Brothers and some went to the Lockport Company. And uh, time by time, they tried to get trucks out. They loaded trucks down here and they loaded trucks to to, to, uh, to uh, Lockport Company, and uh, they they uh, pulled the drivers out and kicked the windows out of them, and stopped them, whichever way they could. And finally, they they brought the the man of police in here. I think they were uh, a picked uh, bunch of a, a riot squad, so to speak. And they come with with long long billies and and uh, prepared to, to to beat us off the railroad track. So we got it there in strength. And uh, some of the younger ones, like myself, that was good at throwing rocks, get up on the hill, what they called it Cal Ward's Hill at that time. He had a house there with pockets full of big rocks to throw. And the others stood on the picket line, and, and some had clubs, and some had pieces of two by four. And, and uh, they met the Mounties, and, and uh, it developed into a a real, you know, we say ding-dong battle. There was men from Gun and Cove, there was men from Cape Island, there was oh, about 600 men here, all together. The train was pulling in up here at the Cold Storage, they had three carloads of fish up there to float. And I was one of the birds that was on the track, and poor old crowbar... Oh, I couldn't have been too far away. Poor old crowbar was standing on the coupling, <laughs> singing God Save the King. Yeah. And I was on the track, and there was about 50 head around my waist like that, and this man who was trying to haul me off. And I grabbed his tunic like that. I said, you, you go ahead and pull. And they was pulling behind me. I could feel my stomach stretching. And by and by, the button started to flew. He said, 
fly. He said, Jesus, he said, I can't get you off of there. I said, forget it. Just about that time, a bunch of women was up there on the hill, and Denver Levy and this Mountie got into a chew over something, and he started to pull his gun, mm. right? And they had these whips with them. And then and, and, and Sealy Turner? Yeah, and... Shove the old hat in. And the head fellow said, put your guns away. Use your... the whips they had, mm. whatever you call them. I don't know what they were, anyhow. So Denver said, take off your tunic, drop the whip, and he said, I'll show you what I'll do with you. Denver Levy, you remember Denver Levy? Oh, yeah. Ernest I'm, Levy's brother. Yeah, he, could do, he could do it, too. Mm. And just about that time, he stooped over for do something, and Florence Turner struck him. You, <laughs> he, you know what I think about the whole thing? With his hat pin. You know what I think about the whole thing? Lockport and, and all the rest of fishing villages right. and the fishing industry. Yeah. So much better off than when me and you had to go. Oh. It shall be lawful for employees to form a union of their choice. It don't say of the company's choice, but their choice. The law that you support it, that you put in politics, whatever. We was only going by what, what it read. And to join the same when formed to bargain collectively yeah. with their employer. PC 1003, still the same. You're saying, and, you're saying some of you are ready to die for that, is what well, uh, that, I what, what, it, that yeah. what it happened? Why, of course. Yeah. Of course you would. Well, you, what's the difference between starving to death and, 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 and being shot? See, we had nowhere to go. But up. Wasn't getting enough out of it anyway, were you? You couldn't, you couldn't work under those conditions much longer. And we listened to these old fellows. They, they're not what, old compared now. I'm old, but uh, Captain Ben McKenzie, a competent man. Dwight Ringer, a good man. And my father was a good man. And John Stewart was a, the, the, the supervisor's father here. He's dead now. But yeah, good man. Don't, don't take any act of violence, boys. It'll hurt you. You know, we've seen how much you could take. We'll get this thing straightened out. And they thought the government would make the companies recognize a union that was, was legal. No. They wasn't going to do it. Like, keep them under your... Put, let them rise their heads. That's what it was. Right after the lockout, how many of the young fellas, the young people was old enough to go in the service, said, well, there's nothing else we can do. We can't make a living no other way. We'll have to go. It wasn't bravery, Bob. No. Was it? It was no bravery on nobody's part, because you oh, no. And how many young fellas left Lockport here? A lot of I was in my 30s then. A lot of them. I left. A lot of them. A lot of them, yes. I left to make a living. Well, then, so you couldn't make a fishing. You couldn't make it now. No, I... Police met me up the road here in front of uh, my father's house. And Mountie put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, under the Defense of Canada Reg Reg Regulation, Section 23, we arrest you. How long were you interned? And I was interned for 16 months. Most of the time in Petawawa, but the last few months in Hull. Why? Under what act? The Defense of Canada regulations. Oh, well, it was, it was very obvious that I had been interned uh, to prevent the organization of the fishermen in Nova Scotia, to intimidate the fishermen in Nova Scotia, and to prevent their organization. Very, very obvious. As Logport suffered through one of the highest proportionate casualty rates of any Nova Scotian community during World War II, Ralph Bell was in Ottawa administering a wartime control board as a dollar a year man for the government and making the contacts with other high-level industrialists that would lead to the amalgam of the three largest fish companies in Nova Scotia as national sea products. They quickly bought up 16 smaller companies unable to compete and forced out. In the mid-1960s, national film board documentaries trumpeted the death of the inshore fishery. The national film board reflected a new golden age of prosperity for fishermen as wage laborers aboard the national sea-owned trawlers. The reality was far different. Dangerous working conditions existed aboard the trawlers and incomes were less than $4,000 a year. In 1970, 300 Nova Scotia inshore and offshore fishermen went on strike in Mulgrave, Petit de Gras, and Canso. Class-conscious fishermen, such as Jamie McKenzie and Everett Richardson of Canso, joined up with the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union from BC to do battle with the fish buyers. Mr. Cowan, Judge Cowan, he was a kind man. 
to kill him. <laughs> that time. We kind of, we kind of made a turning point for in a way, but we thought that might help us out a little bit more than what it did, but turned out that they still turned against us knee in the Labor's Relation Board and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and the whole works was with the companies. So when you gotta, you gotta try to beat the whole works, you ain't got much of a chance. We didn't know what an injunction was and what could happen. We said to hell, you know, well, we're not going to leave the picket line. We're going to stay there. And he ended up to come down and serve the summons on to us for the appearing court. But he told me for the staying up, so I stood up. And, you know, we were all sitting on the one side. And he pointed his finger right at me. He said, I'm making a sample out of you. He said, I'm sentencing you to nine months. And he said, the rest of them, he said, is going with you. And he said, the picket line is still up. He said, you'll be sentenced. I remember that one fellow, he said, uh, 10 days? Did he say 10 days or 10 months? When he said nine months, that uh, kind of took the spark out of me. You know, you don't feel too good over something like that. Well, I said nine months is not so long, you know, try to brighten things up. But when I mean, you sit down there about nine months in the correction center, it is a long time. <laughs> the following day, there was a welfare fellow came in there told me when I would be eligible for parole and stuff like that. And all I wanted was the family looked after. I didn't care if they had kept me there the rest of my life then. Government, whether it's in the fishing industry or in, or in any unionized industry, they always like to call in the courts because the courts are impartial, quote, impartial. And uh, the law is the law and it can't be changed. But that's one point where it clearly pointed out power of labor and working people can change the courts. You were sentenced to nine months, yeah. and how much did you serve? I think it was in three days or four days. Three days. The next, the day after you were sentenced, yeah. wasn't it? Seven, eight thousand people walked off their jobs. But now it's common, because every time they have a strike, that's the first thing they do, is run to the courts, put the leaders in jail, put them in jail. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, that's what I say, if you don't take a strong stand and squash this right away, and it's not going to get any better, it's going to get worse. If you look over the record from uh, 1927 till 1970, you can see that the, 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 the courts, the government, and the fish companies, eh? Uh, the, 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 the courts and the, and the government were the tools of the fish companies who wanted to have a life and death power over the fishermen. The Acadian fishing peoples of New Brunswick refused to go down as a national sacrifice to the ever-increasing demands of corporate capital-intensive strategies and over-investment in fleet development. The stocks were depleted and must be allowed to recover after 30 years of overfishing. Recognizing the common cause of conservation and monopoly control over their lives, the French and English workers united in 1977 under the banner of the Maritime Fishermen's Union, now covering New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. They are once again attempting to win trade union legislation for the inshore sector of each of the three provinces. Con Mills, Maritime Fishermen's Union. It goes to prove that the only friend we got in the fishing industry is the, is the brothers and sisters that's there and we got to get out and do a job to organize them because we know the companies and the, and the government is not going to help us. And when they admit to do that, then I don't want to be a part of them either. It won't be an organization that I, I would believe in. Nickerson National Sea is the General Motors, the IT&T, and the Gulf Western of the East Coast fishery. The, uh Overfishing was endangering the livelihood of 2,000 fishermen on the northern New Brunswick coast of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and those 2,000 were a threat to the multinational. Pas, ils, ils, ils 
The herring seiners are taking everything, even small herring just four inches. If they destroy the herring, there are 2,000 inshore fishermen that will be forced to leave. Un poisson de, 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 de 4 pouces, 5 pouces ne sont pas de là-dedans. S'ils viennent à détruire la hein, hanche, il y aurait peut-être euh, à peu près 2000 pêcheurs certains qui, qui souffriraient de ça. Ah oui, le long des côtes, certains il y a pas 2000 pêcheurs qui prennent un coup. On September 23, 1979, the MFU organized a demonstration in Karakat, New Brunswick. They were protesting the federal government's continued failure to ban the herring saners from fishing the inshore grounds, even before the herring had spawned. 200 men, women, and children were tear gassed by an RCMP riot squad as they attempted to prevent the offloading of the fish that represented their futures. They were gassed in three separate attacks that day. He said, uh, okay, he has advanced all the group uh, with the masks and uh, the gas and so puis ils s'en ont mis dans la ligne, puis ils nous ont crié trois ou trois fois, je pense, qu'ils ont averti, on va avancer. Mais tout le monde semblait penser, « Well, ben, ils Everyone ça, thought the RCMP were just going to intimidate us. Just push us with their sticks. Ils pensaient qu'ils ont poussé avec le, le bâton ou quelque chose. Je sais pas si les autres avaient la même impression comme moi. Il n'y a personne qui s'attendait à ça. Non, moi non, non plus, je ne pas. Moi non plus. Et comme toi, là, tu as eu ta boucane dans les yeux, ça? Oui. Ah ouais? Ouais, c'est pour ça que la première fois, j'étais là, mais après ça, là, j'étais éloigné. Je l'ai vu juste côte à côte à moi, juste avant la relevant de la porte, tu sais. Je l'ai vu une petite fille qui a été tirée sur le ground par les tirs gaz bombes. À un moment donné, quand ils ont tiré les premières bombes, les premiers gaz, gaz bombes, euh, ils ont enlevé de terre à peu près d'un environ, de, de, comme ça, puis ils ont tombé du dos. Les deux, le couple a tombé du dos. On se rend avant nous ici, hein? Puis il a commencé à lancer euh, des bombes parmi euh, des bombes lacrymogènes parmi les, les gens, comme moi, en tout cas dans mon cas, là, je vais pour expliquer ce qui est arrivé à lui. Mais moi, dans mon cas, tout de suite, ils m'ont ils lancé deux, trois bombes, tu vois, sur moi, hein? ça me frappait, ça tombe. Le RCMP began by shooting two or three bombs right on me and Hermann Agilde. Three police took me away and arrested me. Puis, euh, J'essaie de prendre mon vent, il y a trois polices qui m'ont sauté dessus, puis euh, il m'a amené. Il m'a dit que j'étais... Euh, il m'a dit, you're under arrest, puis il m'a amené. Le chef de ma région, de Tracadie, de ce que je viens, il a dit, écoutez, euh, avant qu'il était en train de mettre les menottes derrière le dos, il dit, faisais attention, mettez-les pas trop tête, euh, faisais attention, mettez pas ça... Il a, il a tenu à... I had great difficulty breathing from the tear gas. When I asked an officer for air, he said he only understood English. There was no investigation of the RCMP violence by the Attorney General of New Brunswick. Instead, two union organizers, Gilles Terrio and Hermann Gilles Robichaud, were charged with disturbing the peace of a public facility. It was the evident, broad public support of the Acadian community that prevented stiffer reprisals like those levied on Charles Murray and Everett Richardson. Travailleurs de toutes les nationalités, prison, les chaînes, l'esclavage. À ce que je dans l'union, les grands ont peur, nous autres. Il va falloir qu'ils payent pour notre poisson. On va se défendre tout le monde de la cause, s'organiser, manifester. Ils pourront plus nous amorer, ok. Pas pêcheur, c'est le temps de prendre l'âge. On est là de l'avant, forgeant l'unité. Travailleurs de toutes les nationalités, prison, les chaînes, l'esclavage. Toutes les grosses compagnies, puis leur donner le gouvernement. Ils font penser des lois contre les unions. Merci. Guy Cormier, président de la Maritime Fisherman's Union. Quand tu parles de ces grosses compagnies-là, tu parles aussi du gouvernement. Parce que s'il semble que 
eux, quand ils rencontrent le gouvernement, ils ont tous des avocats. Ce n'est pas des pêcheurs. Premièrement, ce n'est pas des pêcheurs. Nous autres, quand on rencontre le gouvernement, il y a au moins des pêcheurs qui assistent, et c'est des pêcheurs It's qui... C'est hard pour les inshore fishermen. Nickerson National Sea have lawyers that push their cause. I ask the public to see our cause. We just want to live. We love our work. If Nickerson National Sea were not here, we would double our numbers and have a good life. On aime notre métier, et je suis certain que si les, les grosses compagnies comme Nickerson et uh, National Sea étaient pas là, on pourrait doubler le nombre de pêcheurs côtiers en filant nos côtes, et on ferait une belle vie. With the declaration of the 200-mile fishing limit in the late 1970s, and with millions of dollars in federal and provincial handouts, the East Coast fishery was transformed into a state monopoly joint venture. The dominant fish monopoly, Nickerson National Sea, gobbled up fish companies throughout Atlantic Canada, Northeastern United States, and even Uruguay. J.B. Morrow, Vice President, National Sea Products. I think the National Sea example probably is a good one in regard to uh, what others can do. If there's a lot of worry about that company getting too big or the Nickerson company getting too big, uh, there are others that can be just as big and smaller concerns can get together, do a job of competition and use our example to guide the way as to what we can do. And well, uh, you're looking at a boat right here, look, uh, it costs a half a million dollars, you know. And to look at the, the decrease in fish prices, there's no way you can pay mortgages off. There's, uh, you can just barely survive at the expense of the operation of the boat, let alone pay mortgages. So it's, if it's going to come down to that, well, we're going to have to get out of it. The fishermen who are into it now, and what can you expect of a fisherman into it now? What can you expect of his sons? Do you expect him to go back in the boat and, and do what, what, what his grandfather did? There's no way. There's, I hope there's nobody stupid enough to, to think that that's going to happen. You know? There's no way a fisherman's son, today, a fisherman today's son, is going to go back in the boat and, and fish like his grandfather fished for trades. You know, the name of the game is to eliminate that offshore and make this an inshore fishery. And uh, the only evidence of it that I have, of course, is the fact that they want you out of the Gulf, where you used to get 60% of your fish. They want you off George's Bank. They want you off certain parts of Scotia Shelf because that's also Gulf of St. Lawrence fish. And they don't want us in the northern cod. So you tell me, where should you go? Sandy Martlin, a fisheries researcher from St. John's, Newfoundland. Okay, Uruguay has a fascist government, and uh, by investing in Uruguay, National Sea Products is basically supporting that government. And, uh, you know, they're, they're doing this at the same time they're asking for uh, tax dollars from Canada to invest here. If it was really going to benefit a lot of people, you could see, but in most cases, the aid that goes to these uh, countries, Uruguay has a, a military dictatorship. It's in the summer of 1980, for the first time in 400 years, Newfoundland inshore fishermen struck for higher prices at the height of the fishing season. They united with locked out and striking plant workers earning less than $5 an hour. The 35,000 strong Newfoundland fishermen, food and allied workers had shut down the entire industry. An awful lot more than respect involved in this. The price of fish has been uh, in 1970s, from 77 to uh, up till 1980, has been decreasing instead of increasing. Cost of living has gone up to double and three times, and cost of gear, twine, anchors, grapes, everything that's involved in the fishery has been doubling and tripling. And uh, this year, in particular, we've been offered less for a fish than we were uh, than we were getting last year. And last year, we got less for a fish than we were getting the year before. So there's an awful lot more an issue than just respect. The fact that the merchants are still tr still trying to make the the big profits and keep the fishermen down as low as they can. The strike really is about the equality of, of the, the workers in the fish plants uh, versus the workers in other industries. We, we think that we are worth as much and, well I can't say more, but we're worth as much as someone that's working in the meat industry, to someone that's working in any other industry in Canada. I started with fishery products back in 1968 in a little place down in Bonavista Bay, Greenspan. Uh, Later I moved to Trapassian. I came here to Marystown and 
I wasn't involved with unions. I saw how much people were getting their noses rubbed into the dirt, and that's when I got involved. Uh, I got involved for that fact, that I wanted to do something about it. And that's why everyone here wanted to do something about it. That's why we're at on strike. Because we're goddamn well going to do something about it. Excuse the language. <laughs> Very simple. We'll cut that. Yeah, you can cut that. <laughs> we're locked out by National Sea. We've been locked out now, going on three Since weeks. Since the 9th of July. Since the 9th of July. What are the main issues of the lockout? Uh, money. It's the main issue. Uh, what do you get now? What, you mean, what are we being paid now? 4.85 an hour. We work five, six days a week, Saturday's time and a half. We were talking about, uh, especially like in the winter months, Yeah. it's desperate, it's freezing in there, it's the same as outside, it's unbearable. Bridie? Unless you just about wrapped it up there, Muriel, it's, it's just unbearable. unbearable. <laughs> to cover it all. It's too cold, too cold to work. I'm willing to stay out, well, I don't care how long it takes. I'm very determined and I'm sure a lot of us feel the same way. Suppose we're here when the snow is blowing. Yes, <laughs> because I'm sure we'll be just as warm out here as we do in there in the winter time anyway. So, we'll stay out of this what it takes. George Chafe, an inshore fisherman from Petty Harbor. The main thing that we want to get is the system changed and then we'll talk about the price of fish. That system is 400 years old, ever since Jan Cabot came here. And the first merchants came to St. Jan's. As Nickerson is going around Newfoundland now, buying up everything he can get their hands on. And then we're going to have a monopoly, which it should never be. You know, in free enterprise, that's what we're after. We haven't got free enterprise in Newfoundland today. No way have we got it. When we've got two or three merchants controlling the whole works. But we want this system changed. And the only one way we're going to change it is with the fishermen got to get out and fight for the changes. And they're going to fight it on their own this time because the government got no respect for fishermen out here in Newfoundland. They're one of the backwards government I say is in Canada. And now they're starving people to death through not giving them welfare. People who are not dependent on the fishery. They're just out to, to make a few dollars that they wouldn't have to get probably one mo month's welfare. Now I know them on the south coast. There's children up there today with nothing to eat. Just through the means of this, this government that we have in power today. They're really backing the merchants. They're not backing the people, they're backing the merchants in Newfoundland. Like they figure like uh, that we would, if they said uh, they're going to close the doors, we just run, knock on the door and say, boy, let me in, I want to sell fish. You know, I'll sell it for five cents a pound. But they never ever thought that we would take the stand that we have taken right now. And I'd say we're going to hang on to the stand. If they want to lock the doors from now till the voyage is over, we're satisfied. We continue to sort and do what we can with it. You know, we're not going to let them get over our time. They've done it right all down through the years here in Newfoundland, but this is the end of it now. No doubt there's some fishermen that are going to be hurt by this. But the majority of fishermen in Newfoundland will damn well sort their fish and the merchants didn't bank on that. That was their big mistake. And if we, if we have to start sorting, we're prepared. Once we settle in, like George said, and we go back to sorting, we're prepared for a long winter. If they lock us out during the, during the inshore fishery, that's when fish is being landed, we'll damn well make them pay for it before this winter's out. What can we seat down in the stadium, or what can we contain? About 4,000 people. Well, if you can block the stadium, you'll have some amount of fishermen. Then, they're, after all the speechifying is over, they're going to have a motorcade, and we don't know where it's going to. Now, if Peckford was here, I would imagine it might wind up in his lap. You know, we don't really know. But when you hear of people, I told you the story this morning, that's a, a family down in Buren. They don't know where their next cup of tea is coming from. We're going to take a break. Going fishing? Heading for the beach? Don't go hungry. Go with eggs instead. This is a demonstration to show the fish merchants and the government that the, the people in Newfoundland now are beginning to get serious. We have uh, 1,200, 1,500 probably. But the more come, the better and the merrier because the people are suffering now and they can show the government that they are suffering and they're serious. How hard is it now for the uh, families? Well, I got it pretty hard, like I said. I got three kids trying to support them. I'm only getting $65 a week. And, you know, well, I got it pretty, but I'm right behind the fishermen. I'll stay out as long as they do. I'll, I'll support them all the way. The media says that the plant workers are saying they're losing money because of the fishermen. What do you think to that? Probably, yeah, but like I say, I mean, they're losing money too, right? They, they, they're going down with their way to the price of their fish, so... And like I say, I'm behind them all the way, and I'll stay out as long as they do. 
Não vai ficar, né? Come all ye good people, stand up and be strong. We've been stepped on and used for a good while too long. Come on, Newfoundlanders, stand up, organize. We're fed up with promises, rip-offs and lies. And it's hard, hard times. Now our two governments, they don't seem to care If we go through the winter in fur coats or underwear With their money and power, they'll do as they please If t'was left up to them, we would bloody well freeze They sold our fair island, they helped pick it clean With Alcan Sarko and Johnny Shaheen They smiled as they came, but they'll sneer as they go Now they're all millionaires and we're billions in the hole and it's hard hard times organizer father des mcgraw what the fishermen said in portishwa at that time was what we fellas need is a union we need someone to help us get it started and i said to those few fishermen there that day it's not too hard to organize yourselves into a union, but have you got the fortitude or the guts to stay with your union? Do you understand that from time to time you're going to be called upon to stand on a picket line? You're going to be harassed. You're going to be told that you don't know what you're doing. You're going to be told you haven't got the intelligence to negotiate the price of fish or working conditions in a plant. Some 10 years later, while they are getting more money per pound of fish, what does the consumer in our stores pay for the fish? Why is there such still such a big spread? Why is it that the fishermen and the plant workers are still being ripped off in this province? The whole resettlement program, in a way, was an attempt to eliminate the inshore fishery. Right. And now they're going right back through and trying to do the same thing again. Right. So the ill use of governments bringing in this and bringing in that and doing what they like and run fish right off the grounds and not giving them the chance to destroy the whole works. The fish monopolies and the federal government have targeted the livelihood of inshore fishermen for total destruction. In the so-called restructuring of the East Coast fishery in 1984, two super fish companies, Fishery Products International and National Sea Products, now owned by the Sobe, Morrow and Jodry families, were bankrolled with over $200 million of taxpayers' money. In 1986, National Sea Products was given a license to operate Canada's first factory freezer trawler with the potential to strip mine fish from the sea. As I see it, the inshore fishermen are going down the drain fast. The companies are going to push them out. No doubt in my mind, whatever. And the Department of Fisheries along with them. And, and the Department of Fisheries is with the top of them. Yeah. What, what it comes down to as far as the plants promoting the offshore and, and all their technology and their super duper freezer trawlers and everything else is that if they can get people to believe that and want that kind of thing, they're the only people who can operate it. And therefore, that, that's, more, that's more control for them. I don't think the, the, the actual economic viability of those draggers enters into it. I think it's the control of the fishery. And if they can get a fishery that's 90% dependent on those kind of draggers, they got the control. It's people I'm talking about. Now, a company can get one of these bloody big freezer trawlers, you know, and they can put, say, 20 or 25 or 30 people aboard of it, and they got a plant there to look after. But that's it. Centralize everything, eh? Profit. It's for money, you know. The almighty dollar. And, uh, damn it to hell, we're, we're living on the face of this earth, you know, as people. We have to, to work, we have to live. I think we have a right to our resource out here. I don't think that any company has any right to get a machine, I'll call it, you know, to clean up a volume of fish for their own profit that could support, say, a, a thousand inshore fishermen. The Moroni government's 
groundfish management plan of the late 1980s aims to reduce the fish quotas and incomes of the small boat fishermen, force them to lose their boats and their fishing licenses, with their only option to work as wage laborers under the control of the fish monopolies. The result would be the elimination of thousands of inshore fishermen and literally hundreds of Atlantic coastal communities whose lifeblood is the inshore fishery. We know we're getting screwed. We've not been known it for we've known it for a long time. And until the inshore fishermen get together and organize a strong union, we're going to keep on being screwed. Do you think it'll happen in your time, David? Uh, I hope so. I hope I'm around to see it. And I and I'm only a young man yet. I might go. I might go sword fishing. Yes. I can get a boat good enough next summer. I might go. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Go on, I'll take you. I can. I can. I, if I can't do nothing else, I can cook. <laughs> I can run an engine. Well, you go engineer. I can run an engine by <laughs> <engineer. laughs> There's one thing I can yeah. do. <laughs> I remember what the old dad used to tell me when we come on making the land with no radar, no nothing, no nothing but a sound radar. <laughs> very conscious of my people who were Highland Scots and who occupied land for hundreds of years, who uh, depended on themselves and their neighbors who lived uh, a communal type of life and who suffered the indignity of having foreign to them, troops march in, order them out of their houses, set fire to the houses, and, and completely dispossess them. Uh, this was an extremely brutal thing which, unless a person really feels it in their blood, probably doesn't have very much power, but really brutal this was. How different is that from what's happening to the shore fishermen at the present time? But there was no profit in it from anybody. Therefore, he had to go. For the shore fishermen, there is a profit in it for somebody else besides him. And he shouldn't have to go. And he shouldn't have to go.